Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dolph Schluter from the University of British Columbia. He clearly needs no uh, introduction. Everybody uh, knows who he is, and I'm, I'm not surprised. If you want to humbly and experience, do a search for him on Science Citation Index. I, I, I did that, and I decided, well, it's time for me to just wrap up my I'm done. I, he writes more papers than I can read. So, uh, and and uh, he's, he's been very influential in, 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 in many areas. Uh, uh, but principally in uh, thinking of, about the interface of ecology and speciation in the context of adaptive radiation. <coughs> now, this is the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, but it's mostly terrestrial vertebrates, as, as, as we all know. Uh, and Dolph is at least our second speaker this semester who works on fish. But if you don't know, you should know that he started working on birds in the Galapagos uh, Islands. Uh, so he worked on Darwin's finches and then worked on birds in Africa and, and North America for a while. Uh, before turning to sticklebacks, um, he told me earlier today that that was a decision motivated by an interest in, in working in an experimental system where you can you do some manipulations. Uh, so he did his uh, PhD uh, with Peter Grant at the University of Michigan, uh, his undergraduate degree from Guelph, and uh, did a postdoc at Davis before going to UBC where he's been ever, ever since. So it's a, a real pleasure to have you here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming, everyone. Um, it's been decades since I've given a talk here, which is, uh, which is crazy. This is a very cozy arrangement, and the one thing <laughs> <laughs> that I'm worried about is if the questioning at the end becomes particularly severe, it will be difficult for me to make a quick. <laughs> So I've been working on the stickleback system now for uh, some time, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we're currently doing, uh, where it's going, and the kinds of questions we're asking of the system. These represent some very young species in the Popper Lakes at uh, high latitude, and I want to try and connect it a little bit with some larger scale patterns that we also see in the rates at which new species form. <clears throat> so why do I work on speciation? People have asked me this question. And um, so I thought I, would, oops, thought I would start with that. And, and the reason I, I, I worked on speciation, why I became interested in the problem, is that uh, it's the process that leads to species and that sort of basic unit of biodiversity. And uh, probably many of you will agree with me that not much more interesting than that has happened. It's the start of the universe. <laughs> so to be clear about what I mean by uh, species, <clears throat> I'm uh, interested in the, the evolution of reproductive isolation. My examples here, humans and chimpanzees are regarded as separate species, not just because we look different or that there are genetic differences between us, but crucially when it comes time to mating that we would find one another mutually repulsive. <laughs> and that also that if presumably um, hybrids were, were formed, they would have uh, lower fitness. And uh, this led to an inquiry, a brief inquiry on, on, on my side, which was, I wonder if anyone has ever tried before. <laughs> it, it, it turns out that in the 20s, this uh, rogue Russian scientist named Ivanov actually attempted this in both directions. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, his funding was cut off, and in the end he, 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 he ran into a, a shortage of volunteers. <laughs> the, 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 last, the last contributors willing to participate were himself and his son. <laughs> so, some of the questions that I've been interested in in the, the evolution of reproductive isolation, speciation, is uh, foremost, just exactly how does reproductive isolation evolve, and I've been particularly interested in the contribution of adaptation to environment in this process. And the other question I'm interested in is, why does it sometimes evolve so rapidly? And another question I'm interested in and I'm thinking about a bit more is how that relates to variation in rates of speciation um, in space and time, why, why it varies so greatly. And somehow the answers to these questions will lie in the nature of selection and the availability of genetic variation. And that's what I'm going to try and connect. So we have some ideas about how speciation occurs. In fact, the, the sort of the cartoon that we often use to describe the process of the evolution of reproductive isolation comes from Lubchansky in his 1937 um, book. 
And uh, it really is fairly straightforward. The idea is that uh, populations start out as genetically uh, similar and gradually accumulate differences, genetic differences that either prevent them from recognizing one another or alternatively when hybrids are formed they uh, have reduced fitness. But uh, th uh, this cartoon leaves much um, open regarding uh, exactly what those processes are that cause genetic change. And, uh, uh, in recent years we've come to appreciate the importance of natural selection and the evolution of these genetic differences that underlie reproductive isolation, but that still leaves open various ways in which natural selection might produce uh, reproductive isolation, and um, I have found it useful to contrast these two um, models, and one is that um, uh, is the simplest one, and that is that populations adapt to contrasting environments, and in doing so, different alleles are favored, and then ultimately the genetic differences that evolve between populations lead to um, reproductive isolation. But this can be contrasted with the, maybe the null hypothesis for um, speciation and, uh, by selection, and, and that is that populations uh, happen to uh, experience uh, and uh, fix different adaptive mutations that are then incompatible in crosses. Um, and uh, so um, either of these might lead to the evolution of um, incompatibilities between populations. And these incompatibilities in hybrids in particular might result because of inherent incompatibilities between the alleles themselves, the ligand can't talk to receptor, or um, under a more sort of ecological perspective, uh, the fitness of hybrids <coughs> might be low simply because they fall between the niches of the parental farms and they're poorly adapted to both of the environments to which the parents are adapted. And that process in particular has guided our um, understanding of the evolution of reproductive isolation in these much of our work has involved testing in particular, <coughs> contrasting these models. So here's a quick outline of my talk. I'm going to um, describe a little bit what patterns of speciation uh, look like in, um, in the temperate zone in fishes and uh, a little bit of other organisms. And then I'll, uh, I'll give an <coughs> overview of the stickleback system uh, because it helps to um, understand the ongoing studies that we're carrying out on the genetic basis of reproductive isolation between the forms. Some of this is old work, but it helps to set up why exactly we're doing the new work. Uh, to understand uh, speciation in this group, we have to understand that not long ago, uh, every the, where I work was covered by a mile of ice, and uh, none of these populations that uh, I work on are in existence. In fact, none of the lakes that these populations I investigate. <clears throat> and then as the ice uh, melted, and uh, most of it disappeared um, you know, by about 10,000 years ago. The last large expanses of the temperate zone uh, were opened up. And uh, if you look at patterns of speciation across the zone and compare it to uh, latitudes further south, a surprising pattern <coughs> emerges. This certainly surprised me. And that is if you look at the ages of species in the, uh, uh, the New World, at different latitudes in birds and mammals, you find that the, uh, the average age of species tends to decline as you go um, further north. <coughs> so I had always sort of thought in my mind that it's the, it's the tropics where most of the species are, and that therefore, if we want to understand diversity in the tropics, we <coughs> look to why speciation is so much more uh, um, frequent in the in the tropics, but this pattern suggests that actually speciation is happening at a more rapid rate currently at uh, 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 higher latitudes rather than at lower latitudes. And uh, I've given talks to um, uh, naturalist groups <coughs> and so on in Vancouver, and I always tell them if they want to go see lots of species, go to the tropics, go to Brazil and Ecuador and Colombia, but if they want to see lots of speciation, come back. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, there's some indication that the uh, younger average age of sister species in the temperate zone is the result of a faster evolution of reproductive isolation. So it's very difficult to quantify the evolution of reproductive isolation per se. And so what I show here are just surrogate measures from birds. Um, but birds use plumage to tell one another apart. They also use song to tell one another apart. And uh, uh, a couple of studies, this by um, um, uh, Bob Montgomery's group in uh, Queens 
uh, has found that the rate of uh, divergence in uh, plumage patterns uh, tends to increase with uh, genetic distance much faster at uh, high latitudes than at low latitudes. So plumage divergence is happening in birds much more rapidly at high latitudes and at low latitudes, suggesting uh, faster reproductive isolation. And the same is true of uh, characteristics of song evolution. So a former student of <coughs> Jason Weir has been working on this. And uh, this, uh, these data are uh, estimates of latitudinal gradients and the rate of evolution of song uh, pitch. <coughs> and uh, um, for some reason, it evolves faster in forest than in non-forest. But in both cases, the rate at which songs diverge between closely related species uh, it happens faster at higher latitudes than at lower latitudes. <clears throat> and um, uh, so that's pretty interesting. And uh, finally, the same uh, pattern is uh, one that we see in uh, fishes. So this is just uh, North America. Uh, this uh, work hasn't extended all the way back to the tropics. But if you look at the average um, <clears throat> age uh, of uh, sister species of uh, fishes <coughs> as a function of latitude. Again, you find this pattern that, on average, high latitude fishes are sister species of high latitude fishes are younger than at uh, lower latitudes. And uh, this pattern <coughs> um, we've known of uh, for some time in fishes, but I want to emphasize that this pattern is produced by named sister species of fishes, fishes that. Uh, for, for which someone has gone to the bother of actually giving them a Latin binomial. Um, but what we also know about um, northern lakes is that many of them contain lineages of fishes that have undergone uh, um, splitting even more recently. And uh, there are a number uh, of examples of which stickleback is one. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that actually this is going on in many fish lineages. These are. Um, smelts in eastern lakes, where uh, a number of lakes have two forms that uh, show a measure of uh, genetic differentiation between them, with one large form and one smaller form. And in many of these uh, splits that occur in lakes, one of the forms tends to be offshore feeding on zooplankton, and the other tends to be more littoral zone, feeding on macroinvertebrates or fiscal. <coughs> um, <coughs> this is not a, a lake system, but up and down the Pacific coast, we see uh, 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 instances of splitting between um, forms of sockeye salmon. So we're familiar with the, the mighty salmon, which is anadromous, swims out to sea, grows large, comes back to freshwater, and reproduces. And in the same rivers, it may meet uh, these freshwater resident kirkin salmon, and they uh, exhibit a measurable uh, level of uh, reproductive isolation and uh, genetic differentiation. They're not separate species. The level of reproductive isolation is not high. But it represents yet another example of a splitting in process in northern waterways. Louis Bernache in um, Quebec has done a lot of work on the lake whitefishes that are found in uh, lakes of eastern Canada and northern Maine. And uh, frequently, uh, again, you see lakes containing two forms rather than the usual one. One of them is a zooplanktivore, and the other is a larger bodied macular invertebrate feeder. Completely independently, in the same whitefish lineage, but completely independently, there are pairs of largely reproductively isolated whitefish in the uh, lakes in uh, the Yukon. Again, one is zooplanktivorous, the other is <coughs> more benthic. And uh, the, um, the example that I know most, and uh, um, the reason I work on it, uh, it, 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 is because they're smaller in size and easier to, to do experiments on than many of these other groups, is the three-spine stickleback. And I'm going to talk mostly about these <coughs> pairs of species, lakes in which Two forms uh, are observed that are highly reproductively isolated. Uh, they exhibit some degree of genetic differentiation. And they're also ecologically differentiated. <clears throat> but there are other examples of pairs of species that are not uh, uh, sympatric, but uh, that are parapatric. And uh, a number of people, including Felicity Jones, who was here a couple weeks ago, have done work on uh, differentiation between marine and stream <coughs> populations. One thing that attracted me to this particular system uh, was the fact not only were there pairs of species, but that uh, n not only were, w w was there, um, uh, the, the splitting had occurred within the group, but it appears to have occurred multiple times. So there are a number of lakes in the region, uh, not many, and uh, in, in which you find uh, two forms. And uh, in each case, you know, one of them tends to be smaller than the other, although there's a lot of variation in 
the differences that one sees between the uh, benthic type and the limitic type. Um, in general, one of them is a, a smaller bodied, more zooplanktivorous uh, than the other one, which is more littoral zone. <clears throat> and um, uh, so it became an attractive system to work on, not just because the species were very young and were so ecologically differentiated, but because they seemed to have evolved in parallel repeatedly. And that suggested that uh, uh, general laws were at work. <laughs> <laughs> so these pairs of species occur in only five uh, small lake systems in uh, only this part of the world. And uh, the question as to why you only find them here is uh, an interesting one. <clears throat> they tend to occur in very depopulate lakes. Most lakes in this region have other fish species, <clears throat> particularly prickly sculpin and a number of other uh, fish taxa. But what is somewhat peculiar about all these small lakes that contain pairs of species is that they contain stickleback, cutthroat trout, and nothing else. <clears throat> so a highly depopulate lake appears to be part of the requirement for the existence of these pairs. So five uh, uh, small lake systems on uh, Texada Island, uh, Lisquiti Island, uh, Nelson Island, and uh, Vancouver Island. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned in passing that these are all federally listed endangered species. Uh, they're probably the most endangered group of fishes in the country, and two of the pairs are already extinct, the Hadley Lake and the Enos Lake. So the phylogenetic history of these forms is not well known, and it's partly because they um, are so very young. And uh, what is becoming clear is that different genes uh, have different histories within this group, and that just messes up phylogeny, the idea of phylogeny. But uh, this is a, a, a fairly poorly resolved phylogeny based on microsatellites that Rick Taylor put together a number of years ago, and I just wanted to show it to you, poor that it is, um, because in order just to uh, stress that there's no indication that each of these forms, each of these ecotypes has arisen just once and then become distributed. <clears throat> but rather they are sort of embedded in a tree that, uh, uh, in which uh, single species populations uh, occur. And um, it's possible to you know, carry out formal tests of whether each of them uh, originated just once. Or alternatively, the other extreme, where e each of them has arisen multiple times uh, within a lake by a sympatric speciation. Event. And uh, according to this microsatellite tree, both of those alternatives could be ruled out. <clears throat> so the formation of these pairs is probably the result of uh, two invasions from the sea, rather than bona fide, complete sympatric speciation. Although there is evidence that reproductive isolation and ecological differentiation has become uh, strengthened in sympatric. <clears throat> so this is an unpublishable phylogeny of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the groups, but I put this together based on sort of a hodgepodge of different kinds of data <clears throat> as best I could to try to put sort of reproductively isolated forms on the tips where, where people have actually shown that there's a, a, a fairly high degree of reproductive isolation between this population and other populations nearby, say the marine form, in most cases, or in the species pairs, the, the limitics and the benthics. And um, those of you that have done um, uh, much analysis of phylogenies will recognize that this kind of a tree structure where pretty much all of the action is in the, uh, is in the tips is indicative of either of two things. And the first is a recent burst in the production of new species, or alternatively, a, a fairly long history of a sustained high speciation and extinction rate. Either way, there's lots of speciation going. So some of the ecological differences I want to review <clears throat> um, a little more deeply because they'll play a role uh, when I talk about the genetics experiment a little later on. So once again, the limnetic, the one we call, the form we call the limnetic species feeds out in the open water on uh, zooplankton. This is a calanoid copepod. And in one of the lakes, Paxton Lake, that I've studied the most, it's primarily what they feed upon in the uh, non-breeding season. And uh, co calanoid copepods are, 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 are extraordinary. Uh, Organism, and the, the only organism that I know of that's com that's capable of vaporizing and reappearing a short distance away. <laughs> and they, they move incredibly uh, rapidly, and how, how the stickleback catches them is uh, is uh, with a with a sort of a fast uh, forward, um, a fast start forward. Benthics 
uh, feed on uh, invertebrates obtained in the littoral zone or in the deeper sediments, where they pluck them either from the sediment or from uh, vegetation. And it's possible to um, use stable isotopes to quantify these differences between the two forms. So stable isotopes are used uh, uh, frequently in aquatic ecology because they are indicative of some fairly fundamental um, uh, ecological differences between the forms. So the units don't matter so much other than just the left-right. So generally, uh, on the uh, carbon isotope axis, the way it's normally uh, computed, generally um, uh, points over to the right indicate that the ultimate source of carbon came from the littoral zone. Whereas on the left, the ultimate source of carbon came from phytoplankton in the uh, open water zone. So, so carbon isotope ratio is a, a good index of sort of a more littoral habit or a, a more zooplanktivorous habit. <clears throat> Nitrogen isotope is also informative um, because the ratio changes every time something is uh, eaten. And so it's a, a, a measure of uh, trophic level. And uh, limnetics have a slightly higher uh, trophic level than uh, ventix because they feed on copepods that are themselves predatory. And so um, I'm going to show this graph a little uh, again later, but I want to just sort of have you um, be familiar with this isotope space, nitrogen carbon, with more limnetic like in the upper left and more benthic like in the lower right. <clears throat> So um, we've been working with um, uh, Matt McGee in Peter Wainwright's lab uh, at Davis, who has been using these sort of Wainwrightian biomechanical models to understand a little bit uh, just exactly how these things uh, feed, and it's been very um, illuminating. So the way the jaw uh, of, a, of, a, of a benthic is built is they have a fairly large uh, mouth and uh, gape. And, uh, they have this, and um, they have this uh, hypertrophied uh, apaxial muscle on their back, which they use to open the jaw. <coughs> and they open the jaw relatively slowly, but in doing so, they generate a high uh, suction. So benthics are basically built to suck. <coughs> Whereas uh, limnetics, in contrast, have a smaller buccal volume, and uh, although they use suction, how they catch these calanoid copepods is that they. They not only dart uh, forwards using um, a fast dart, an S dart, they uh, rapidly open the jaw and throw it far forward and basically get as close as possible to the, to the copepod as quickly as possible in order to um, suck, it, suck it in. And so it's possible to use measurements of bones of the jaw to uh, uh, estimate just how fast they can, uh, they can open the jaw, how far they can throw it, and how much suction they can generate. <clears throat> These differences matter. <clears throat> so we've done a series of transplant experiments in the lakes to show that uh, the different body forms possessed by these uh, species uh, provide a substantial advantage in both feeding efficiency and uh, growth rates of individuals in the contrasting environments. Um, <clears throat> another pattern, in fact, this was the one that originally got me interested in working on uh, stickleback. Uh, because when I started working on them, I was particularly interested in the role of competitive interactions in divergence and adaptive radiation. But there's a, a very clear pattern whereby wherever you get two species in a lake, they're ecologically highly differentiated. Uh, whereas uh, in lakes that contain only a single species but are otherwise similar in size and uh, uh, composition, species composition, the, they, the forms tend to be intermediate. And they tend to exploit both littoral zone and uh, open water zone. And the other thing, of course, that if the explanation of character displacement, that this is competition-driven divergence, competition-driven divergence is caused by uh, selection against intermediate phenotypes. That's uh, something that we think also might play a role in speciation since hybrids are intermediate. And finally, more recent result I thought you'd be interested in, although it's not closely connected to the story, the rest of the story that I'm telling today is that, uh, that there's actually higher phenotypic plasticity in these solitary populations as well <coughs> compared to um, <coughs> the forms. And uh, in, in the characteristics that we measured the marine form also, which is the ancestor of all of these freshwater populations, also has relatively low plasticity. 
So secondarily, if you need to this, it has evolved to a higher rate in these solitary cycle back populations. And then lost in the pairs. <coughs> so how do, how do new species <laughs> form when they form ridiculously fast? So I, I showed you sort of a general pattern where in fishes as well, at least in other uh, vertebrates, uh, rates at which new species are forming currently um, appears to be very high. And uh, the, the, the rate of species formation is <coughs> apparently very high in these stickleback species. They occur only in a handful of lakes. And uh, these lakes are 12,000 years old. Uh, how is it possible for for new species to rise on this time scale. Now I mentioned that the lakes were probably, uh, the, the pairs are probably the result of a double colonization. And we have investigated whether uh, there is already some degree of reproductive isolation between them. Uh, ecologically differentiated populations that are also <coughs> Africa. The answer is yes. So the time frame is, a, is not just 12,000 years, but nevertheless it's clear that this has all happened very rapidly. And um, <clears throat> one of the, the, the sort of the model that we began with to investigate the evolution of reproductive isolation in this group is this sort of old idea, uh, simply that, not, that reproductive isolation evolves as a byproduct of adaptation to contrasting environments. And so we had a, a, a sort of model that we were interested in testing, a model in mind, whereby we imagine that these two forms are uh, adapted to very distinct repeatable um, ecological niches, and that this has brought uh, a, a strong measure of reproductive isolation along with it. And uh, I'm not going to go into great detail about um, how we established this, but I wanted to mention a couple of tests. This is again related to the work that uh, we've done recently and are working on currently. And uh, the first is uh, to investigate whether um, reproductive isolation, not just uh, phenotype, not just ecotype, but reproductive isolation uh, has also ha has evolved in parallel in association with adaptation to these contrasting ecological niches. And then uh, second, uh, testing whether the fitness of hybrids has an ecological basis. Are hybrids, is hybrid fitness reduced because they are intermediate in phenotype and fall between the niches of the parental forms? So those are two among a series of tests in which we've which we've carried out in order to investigate this overall question, does reproductive isolation evolve as a byproduct of adaptation? So the, the, um, the way we did the mating incompatibility study, the study of parallel evolution of mating incompatibility studies, <coughs> again, to bring all of these populations into the lab and to you know, take a female from one population in one lake, say the benthic from Paxton Lake, and uh, to um, put her in a tank with a nesting male, either of the lunatic type or the benthic type, from another lake, say Enos Lake, and just ask with which male will she mate most readily. <clears throat> so we know that within a lake, benthics and lunatics are highly reproductively isolated. <clears throat> a small percentage of hybrids is produced um, uh, each generation. Uh, but for the most part, they, they mate true. They find one another mutually repulsive. Um, but <laughs> is this associated with all of the other adaptations that uh, they possess in association with the different environments they occur in? Or has it, involved, has it evolved idiosyncratically and uh, unrelated to their <coughs> ecological differences? So the idea behind this test was to <coughs> investigate whether ecotype predicted compatibility. And the overall uh, picture is that yes, it does. And so whether we and when we place a, a, a lunatic with a, uh, from one lake with a lunatic from the other <coughs> lake, from another lake, they will mate uh, 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 fairly readily, just as a lunatic and a benthic from the same lake. Whereas if we take a lunatic and benthic from the same lake, or a lunatic and a benthic from each from different lakes, we find a low level of uh, mating compatibility. So from this, we uh, interpreted uh, we, we, we derive the interpretation that mating compatibility has evolved in association with all of these other phenotypic differences that, uh, that, um, that they possess and that have evolved in parallel. And that implies that natural selection is somehow involved in the evolution of reproductive isolation and that 
perhaps in the same way that natural selection is involved in the parallel evolution of all these uh, phenotypic traits that differentiate, such as jaw. And we've also done transplant experiments in the lake to show that uh, F1 hybrids raised in the lab do just fine. But if you take them to the uh, take them to the wild, then in the littoral zone they do worse than the benthic, <laughs> and in the open water zone they do worse than the limitic. And a former student of mine, Howard Rundle, has taken this to the next step with a, a reciprocal transplants involving back crosses as well. And the, the overall picture is that basically how well a hybrid does in a particular environment uh, is, is uh, uh, predictable overall from just how much of its what fraction of its genome is made up of the parental species in that habitat. So a benthic back cross is better in the littoral zone than a lamitic back cross, vice versa in the open water. So again, uh, there appears to be an ecological basis to um, hybrid fitness. And uh, so um, these two, along with other tests, uh, suggest that um, that, that this model whereby reproductive isolation evolves as a byproduct of adaptation to contrasting environments is, is, uh, is correct. <clears throat> so uh, I want to return now to this question, and, uh, <coughs> and that is how, how does reproductive isolation evolve and why does it sometimes evolve so rapidly? And I've talked a little bit about the nature of selection. I could go on for hours, but I'm going to spare you. Uh, give you the ju just the basic picture of divergent natural selection, contrasting environment associated with the evolution of reproductive isolation. <clears throat> but I, I, I feel that to fully answer this question, we also need to know something about the material basis of reproductive isolation, the sources of genetic variation themselves, and just exactly how genes underlying reproductive isolation are linked to the phenotypes in the selection. And uh, so <clears throat> we've begun a project to investigate the genetic basis of um, reproductive isolation in the Stanley species <laughs> pairs. And uh, much of this work is going on in the experimental ponds, so you see one here. And the kinds of questions that we're asking with this investigation are, <clears throat> uh, well, you saw Felicity Jones's talk. and. Uh, one of the most spectacular results that has emerged from the genetics work uh, that's been carried out so far on stickleback is that um, much of the genetic variation that separates populations uh, is the result of uh, older standing variation rather than new mutations. And uh, much of this variation is older than the populations themselves. So we're very much interested in knowing whether the same is true of those uh, genetic differences that underlie reproduction. Um, also, what is the link between uh, phenotypic differentiation and reproductive isolation? So we want to know something about whether um, there's a, a link between effective gene flow and the regions of the genome where phenotypic differences actually map. Whether assorted mating actually maps to the same regions of the genome as the traits that distinguish them. Whether the same genes repeatedly underlie the divergence of limitics and benthics. Not only potentially have um, has reproductive, have mating incompatibilities evolved in parallel? You know, is, is this in fact the result of the fixation of alleles at the same uh, loci, same alleles even, or at least alleles with a common history? <coughs> and then uh, finally, to, to what does it take to produce a limetic and benthic in fairly short order? Changes at a few key genes, or is this just a quantitative trait? It's reproductive isolation and phenotypic difference. <clears throat> and so I want to tell you quickly about the three <coughs> studies that are in progress um, to investigate and answer these questions. And one is to map the phenotypic traits that adapt populations to their contrasting environments, and that determine the feeding performance of hybrids. <clears throat> the second is to uh, map mating preferences and then uh, evaluate to the extent to which they map to the same regions of the genome as their phenotypic differences, and then assess the age and biogeographic distribution of the adaptive mutations are the mutations old and where they come from. So I don't really have much to say about two and three yet. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, and uh, I'll tell you instead about um, the results of the first experiment.
<clears throat> so for this um, project, uh, it involves a collaboration between my lab and um, uh, Katie Peichel's lab. So Katie was a postdoc of David Kingsley at Stanford, and uh, was, um, I guess, right there uh, uh, at the start, at the, at the dawn of uh, stickleback genetics. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, the work was primarily conducted by uh, Gina Conte, a PhD student in my lab, and Matt Arnegard, a postdoc in my lab, and then uh, Katie's lab. And uh, the work was carried out in the uh, experimental ponds, which are located, if you can believe this, on the UBC campus. <clears throat> this is a view of them from space. <laughs> <laughs> so each of them is, uh, <clears throat> each of them is uh, 25 meters by uh, 15 meters. And they have a sort of a shallow littoral uh, uh, zone at one end and then a six meter deep hole at the other. So the ponds were constructed in such a way as to um, mimic, but on a very small scale, the uh, niche differences that we see in the natural lakes. Here's a sort of a cartoon cutaway of their, um, <coughs> their profile of, of uh, each pond. <coughs> so we were interested in uh, mapping the traits that differentiate the species as a way of investigating the um, genetic basis, uh, not just of the differences between species, but also of the fitness of hybrids. So in our, in our sort of model uh, of how we thought environments might lead to the production of new species, as populations become better adapted to their uh, contrasting environments, uh, hybrids are intermediate and are maladapted to both of the parental forms. And that's sort of a, a simple, but nevertheless, um, useful view of how uh, at least one component of hybrid fitness might, uh, one component of reproductive isolation hybrid fitness uh, might evolve uh, during differentiation. And, uh, and so to do this, <clears throat> we, we made a cross uh, between, uh, or we made crosses between uh, Linetics and Benthix. Uh, F1 hybrids were raised in the lab and then the F1 hybrids uh, were uh, in when they were one year old thrown into a pond. And the beautiful thing about these ponds is <coughs> so we constructed them, we seeded them, and then we do nothing. We don't have to feed fish or anything. Like that. These are wild populations from our perspective. So we just throw in the F1 hybrids and they make their own F2. <laughs> no, no feeding fish. And not only that, we've managed to convince animal care that these are wild populations. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so we don't really have to worry about what goes on in a pond. So the F2s grow in the ponds. They, they develop whatever phenotypes they would develop in a semi-natural environment. They choose whatever diet they choose to feed on in this environment. And then we collect them. And uh, we're able, of course, to look at what their last meal was. <clears throat> um, but we could also use the stable isotopes to evaluate um, what they fed on for the most part during their development. So I already showed you this plot, and I'm just showing it one more time so that I can, uh, um, so it'll be easier to understand the next plot that I'm going to show you. So once again, a uh, stable isotope of nitrogen indicating trophic level on this axis, uh, stable isotopes of carbon on this axis, sort of littoral, more uh, pelagic uh, at either extremes. And then uh, when we plotted on this same space the isotopes of the uh, F2 hybrids, we got segregation. So each dot represents a single uh, F2 hybrid individual, uh, a subadult, a, a, a juvenile collected in the fall of its first year of life. And so the major axis of niche differentiation is represented by this axis here from the more linetic like <coughs> zone up here to the more um, benthic like zone here. And so we do have individuals at those extremes, but the, the highest density is in the middle. And so most individuals were segregated along this um, axis of niche differentiation, except for this oddball group here that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about right now. Uh, anyway, this was, uh, this was one of those experiments where you do the experiment and you have no idea whether this will work. Because um, 
it, it was the first experiment that we carried out in this plant facility, and we weren't sure whether different individuals, on the basis of their makeup, genetic and phenotypic, you know, would on such a small scale actually choose to, you know, be I'm, I'm a zooplanktivore, that's just what I am, and uh, or I'm a, I'm a more littoral zone forager. Uh, that, that they would actually uh, differentiate as individuals and, and that they would actually produce um, segregation variants. So th this represents variation in uh, ecological niche, but also behavior because we haven't placed them other than in the pond. They are choosing where to feed. So it represents a, a, in many ways a, a behavior as well. <clears throat> so if we overlay uh, what we also did is we measured everybody's body size. And if we overlay body size onto uh, the, the, the same isotope space, what we found is that along this sort of major axis of niche differentiation from more lamedic-like uh, and more benthic-like, we found that those uh, individuals that were the most extreme phenotypically actually had the highest average body size. And that there's this sort of like, uh, a, a saddle here. And so that we reproduced the pattern that we had evidence for from our transplant experiments in the native lake, namely that hybrids suffer a disadvantage because they're intermediate. But here we see this um, uh, replicated within a single F2 population. <clears throat> um, and uh, as I mentioned before, there's lots of segregation variation along this axis, but then there's this oddball group. And I just wanted to point out that that oddball group is, is in a body size pit. Okay. And uh, we used body size, it's not um, fitness, we, we chose our words carefully and referred to it as performance. But we presume it has some relationship between reproductive success. And so these oddballs are in the, uh, in the, the, the pit. So the traits then, what we found basically, the, 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 I'm not going to go into the detailed um, analysis, but what we found basically is that the phenotypic traits are, are associated with niche use, and uh, uh, these traits map all over the place. So this is just, I don't know what this is, I'm not going to tell you very much, it's just a chromosome. <laughs> 12, if you must know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is just showing, uh, you know, one and a half lot intervals of a number of traits that map to this region of chromosome 12. And they include phenotypic traits like gill, number of gill rakers, uh, but also the size of this apaxial muscle that influences suction. And as a consequence, suction index score also maps to um, chromosome 12. <clears throat> and uh, from this, we built a model of. Um, uh, niche score, and, we're, and, and even if we allow only one uh, genetic factor per chromosome, we find that uh, niche score along this axis, from more lamedic to more benthic, maps to over half the chromosomes in the genome. This is a quantitative trait. Unique for stickleback, I think. Uh, everything else seems to be uh, more mendelian. <clears throat> and not only that, but the, uh, the contribution of each of these regions of the genome to uh, niche score position along this limetic benthic axis is largely additive. So basically just count up the number of um, benthic alleles uh, at all of these, uh, in, uh, all of these um, genetic regions and you can predict to a large extent how benthic the F2 hybrid is. In, in, in contrast those individual F2s that had low numbers of uh, benthic alleles <clears throat> um, uh, uh, across the genome tended to be more limnetic in their, in their uh, niche score. So niche position is, uh, <clears throat> has, a, has, a genetic, has a qualitative genetic basis largely. And each of these factors contributes about 1 to 3 percent to, uh, to uh, uh, niche score. So we were interested in the fact that this was largely additive <coughs> because cause it kind of conformed to <clears throat> our initial model that uh, why do hybrids do poorly? Why does reproductive isolation evolve? Why does postzygotic isolation evolve when populations become adapted to contrasting environments? Well, it evolves because hybrids are intermediate. And uh, so the genetics of this kind of reproductive isolation, this form of reproductive isolation, 
<coughs> is the genetics of the traits that cause hybrids to be intermediate. And that and that's that sort of ecological perspective on, on uh, speciation sort of contrasts with um, I think of what what we know from um, genetic model systems that have investigated um, the processes that underlie hybrid sterility or inviability in say Christophila, which involve strong interactions between genes that can be measured even in the laboratory. So this was kind of interesting because it's so different. It's, it's so repetitive and it's so outdoorsy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of a, a different way of thinking about how reproductive isolation might um, uh, evolve in a system like this. <clears throat> Uh, but actually, it, it, it's a little more interesting than that. So I've stressed up to now just how additive and uh, quantitative all of this is, but it turns out there is some epistasis. And, and by investigating this epistasis, I think we, we have come to a, a, a slightly better understanding of the genetics of post-zygotic isolation in the, the, uh, uh, the evolution of post-zygotic isolation in these, um, these species. And, and, and we gained that understanding by looking at these oddballs here. So this represented a class of F2 uh, individuals that weren't segregating along the, the limnetic benthic um, axis. And, so, and we were interested in why their isotope signature is so unique and different from the usual limnetic benthic pattern that we see in the wild. And when we, when we looked at what their last meal was, they were full of columbola. So springtails, and uh, presumably they were just obtaining this off the water surface. So they had uh, basically invented a novel niche. Now you can you can find columba in the stomachs of stickleback occasionally, but uh, it's not a major part of the diet. But these guys these guys have a lot. So um, in these little plots over on the right hand side, I'm going to distinguish sort of the, the more limnetic extreme uh, 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 F2 individuals from the more benthic extreme F2 individuals from the A or alternative um, stickleback, the alternative phenotypes. <laughs> and so this is just the frequency of columbola in the diet. It was really high in the... <clears throat> so this was kind of bizarre, and we thought at first, oh, well, this is just a pond artifact. Let's think of a way to remove these points from the plot. <laughs> um, uh, but when we, looked at these, uh, um, when we looked at these fish a little more closely, we, we learned something else that was kind of cool about them. And that was that uh, when we looked at their, their jaw characteristics, we found that they were unusual in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an important way. And that was they were very benthic-like for some features of the jaw and very limnetic-like for other features of the jaw. So they were extreme in their mismatch between different components of the jaw that uh, influence either whether they can suck or whether they can throw. And uh, so basically, what we found is that in something like uh, uh, opening in lever lower jaw, they're incredibly limnetic-like. <clears throat> um, but in terms of the length of the premaxilla, the part of the jaw that's thrown forward when catching zooplankton, they're um, sorry, they're incredibly they're incredibly benthic-like. And uh, so we haven't, you know, done high-speed video on these hybrids or measured their performance on this. So what what you're hearing now is just interpretation. But our interpretation is that basically these guys can neither suck nor throw, so they, had, they invented a new uh, niche. They, they found something, they chose something that would provide them with uh, uh, something they could catch, I presume. Because they can't catch calamites, I can tell you that. I'm, I'm willing to bet my life on that. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, so when we looked at the QTLs, the genomic <laughs> regions that underlay these traits, we could find a kind of uh, weak pairwise uh, epistasis. So the, the, reason, the reason I find this interesting, and the, the reason why I like my own interpretation of these results, is that actually it shows that the, um, the buildup of reduced hybrid performance during the process of adaptation to contrasting environments will also cause hybrids to form that, uh, that are mismatches uh, in terms of the traits used to obtain resources from those contrasting environments. And so, in many ways, this is a—I think of this as an ecological analog of the usual uh, hybrid incompatibilities that uh, we typically find when we cross Drosophila in a lab and find, you know, ligand doesn't talk to receptor. But this is a kind of Muller-Dobzhansky incompatibility 
but one that's based on simple mismatch between the phenotypic traits, and one that wouldn't be noticeable in the lab at all, because when we feed these fish, they all do fine. So uh, the reason I like this is because it means that not everything is additive, and that there is a connection between our sort of ecological, our developing ecological model for how new species form um, with the, uh, the, the burgeoning genetic literature on the, the basis of hybriding compatibilities in species in general. Anyway, a, I, I see this as a, as a way of, of, of bridging uh, or connecting the evolution of hybrid incompatibility literature from Drosophila. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I just said this, and we're running out of time. <laughs> I don't have much time left, but I'm just going to tell you about a couple of other projects that we're also doing as part of the three. The, the second is the map mating preferences <clears throat> and uh, uh, measure their linkage to genes underlying the, 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 the phenotypic traits that differentiate these forms. And so we're also doing this in the ponds. And this is a photograph of some benthics and some limnetics. There are microhabitat differences between the two species in uh, where they actually like to put their nests. Males build nests, attract females, and then they look after the young. So what we did in this experiment is we threw wild benthic males into uh, ponds and also wild limnetic males, and they could just go where they wanted to go, build their nests where they wanted to, and true to form, benthics nested in the vegetation, limnetics out in the open. <clears throat> and then we throw F2 hybrid females raised in another pond into this pond. <clears throat> and then we go in with uh, a snorkel and mask and a snuba gear, and uh, we raid the males' nests. <laughs> So there's a, a molecular developmental biologist, Katie Peichel, in a pond, <laughs> and uh, uh, Matt Arnegar. And uh, what, they're in, what they're searching for is gold. <laughs> so that's a clutch uh, of, uh, of stickleback eggs. It's probably more than one clutch. And uh, so what we do is we bring the embryos back into the lab, and we, um, we keep them happy for a few days until they reach a developmental stage where we can get enough DNA out of them, and then we do parentage. And so we are able then to tell whether we're able to identify which species of male every F2 hybrid female mated with. And in this way, we'll be able to map her preference uh, directly. And so uh, these results, uh, I don't have any uh, results yet. I can tell you that we've now done all the parentage. We have uh, all the results. We have a tentative QTL for, for uh, uh, mate preference. <laughs> so the results in the are still pending. <clears throat> and uh, quickly, I just want to talk about uh, where we're going to try to identify uh, the um, age and biogeographic dist distribution of the adaptive mutations. So uh, Felicity, with uh, Felicity Jones, uh, her, her help, her tutelage, I personally am um, comparing the genomes of, uh, of uh, limnetics uh, and benthics. And uh, uh, it, it's taking some time, but it, it's actually possible. <laughs> but what I want to show here, I don't have any results from the <coughs> uh, um, genome analysis, but these results are just from a, a paper at, um, that uh, Felicity published a couple of years ago that just focused on a, a smattering of uh, a SNPs distributed across the genome. And uh, what, what she did was she discovered uh, among the, these SNPs that there are, um, there are a number which show fixed differences between uh, the limnetics and the benthics. And uh, those are of great interest to us because uh, these species are um, not 100% uh, reproductively isolated. They have a long history of hybridization. And uh, what that means is that any SNP which is um, strongly differentiated between the forms either contributes to reproductive isolation or is linked to something that does. So these, uh, these SNPs tell us something about um, reproductive isolation. And perhaps uh, uh, at the moment they don't t tell us very much about how old the uh, <coughs> mutations are, but they can or potentially tell us something about where they came from. So green is a SNP that's fixed in the benthics in all three legs, and uh, yellow is a SNP that's fixed in the limnetic. The other allele is fixed in the limnetic in uh, all three of the lakes that she surveyed. What I want to show in this picture is that those alleles are found elsewhere in freshwater um, populations in the, in the Pacific. And uh, in my mind, what that, and, and in some cases, they're even polymorphic. 
<clears throat> in the other populations. And so what my, in my mind, this just means that these alleles aren't, these differences aren't the result of independent new mutations over and over again in these species pairs. That they probably came from the sea. And they're probably still there. <clears throat> and that's really the only point I wanted to make uh, with these data. Here's a couple of other uh, 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 SNPs as well. Um, what I wanted to show with, with uh, this particular example is that at the moment, based on this smattering of SNPs across the genome, that there's no particularly strong pattern or biogeographic signal. So for example, this particular SNP, which is fixed in the uh, benthic, is found in other populations, but mainly in the North Pacific, whereas in contrast, these are th th this one here is t t tends to be found in more southern populations. And so at the moment, there isn't sort of you know, one place, it seems, it's, it's still possible, but it, it seems as though it's, there, there, there isn't currently in a one source for all of these populations. Not only that, I'd be willing to bet that they're not all the same uh, age. And uh, my w one example of that is that this allele, uh, for example, is uh, found also in the Atlantic. And uh, the last connection between the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, stickleback, is, uh, relevant to stickleback is that that event which actually resulted in the colonization of the Atlantic from the Pacific, something on the order of 200,000 years ago. So, so I'd be willing to bet this mutation is 200,000 years old, but this one and uh, many of the others are confined to the Pacific and never made it across. So that's an introduction to the stickleback species pairs. <coughs> the work on selection that we've done previously and what we're now looking for uh, in our uh, genetic studies of uh, the species pairs. And so I don't have any hard and fast conclusions, but I can make some preliminary ones. And that is, I think, why, why, this, why is speciation so rapid in this group? I think it's for two reasons. These are highly depopulated lakes. There's strong selection, and there's abundant standing genetic variation that these animals brought with them when they colonized from the sea. And, uh, the levels of divergence that we see at these and adaptables are, 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 I'm pretty sure, going to be inconsistent with the 12,000 years. Uh, I suspect that, the, that most of the reproductive isolation, or a large fraction of reproductive isolation between limnetics and benthics is older than limnetics and benthics. Um, <clears throat> and they, everybody came from the sea, so that's likely how they got into these lakes. <clears throat> so how did any stickleback species evolve? Don't yet know. You know stay tuned. But um, because a lot of these genetic differences that have been found in stickleback are relatively old, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if today's species pairs are just today's species pairs. And that um, in the past there may have been species pairs as well that were wiped out by advances of, 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 of glaciers. And that the present day species pairs might just be, you know, permutations of variation that may have manifested in the past potentially as species pairs, if not full-blown pairs, then certainly populations adapted to contrasting uh, environments elsewhere uh, in the range. And then, you know, potentially these species pairs represent instances not just of speciation, but of re-speciation. <coughs> but as I said, this is still a tentative conclusion. And uh, I have so many people to thank, <coughs> and uh, funding agencies too. <coughs>